Watch this. It didn't take long for pro-choice advocates to file a lawsuit against Idaho's new abortion ban. Too soon, if you ask Idaho's Attorney General's office. With just a few weeks left before it goes into effect, they want to slow down the judicial process. Our nation's first national park, Yellowstone, has been around for 150 years. Now they're planning for 150 years from now. But what about right now? Well, you can support both, but it'll cost you. Classic, Ionic, Iconic. Three ways to describe today's where it's at feature. So do you know where it's at or where it is or whatever? You know what I mean. You know, timing has played a big part of Senate Bill 1309. It'll ban abortions after six weeks of pregnancy before most women even realize they're pregnant. Family members can sue the doctor up to four years after doing the procedure. Governor Brad Little wanted, or waited, I should say, to the last possible moment to sign it into law. He did it with an hour to spare. And in doing so, he started the clock to when the law actually goes into effect. 30 days from when he signed it, April 22nd, or 17 days from today. Exactly one week after he signed it, Planned Parenthood filed a petition asking Idaho Supreme Court to block it just weeks before it becomes law. So you can understand their urgency, but the Idaho Attorney General's office thinks it's too soon. They want to slow down the judicial process, even change its course. Joe Paris explains the situational crossroads and where it goes from here. In response to a petition filed by Planned Parenthood seeking to block Idaho's new abortion law, the Idaho Attorney General's office says they need more time after a quick turn of events. Planned Parenthood filed a petition with the Idaho Supreme Court back on March 30th. Part of that filing included a request for an expedited process, Did you talk which to the court today? granted the next day, March 31st. The reason for the expedited process, Planned Parenthood wants to get the new abortion law blocked before it's supposed to go into effect on April 22nd. But court records show that the Idaho Attorney General's office, who's representing the state of Idaho in this case, is pushing back. They're saying that things are moving too quickly. They write in an April 1st court filing that, quote, through no fault of its own, respondent did not have an opportunity to file its opposition to the petitioner's motion to expedite briefing and argument prior to the granting of this motion. The AG's office point to three major issues that they have with the expedited hearing. To summarize, one, the complexity of the case warrants more time and rushing through it will compromise careful consideration. Two, the petition by Planned Parenthood includes issues better served by a lower court. And three, the AG's office believes that there are other avenues that Planned Parenthood could take to get the relief they seek. In an extended explanation, the AG's office reiterates that they believe a lower court should take on the issue because of the nature of the claims and process. They write that instead of the Supreme Court, quote, the district courts are designed to provide for the timely gathering of facts and evidence as well as to hear disputes regarding such, while the Supreme Court is primarily a court of review. In responding court filing, counsel for Planned Parenthood argues that there is plenty of time for the AG's office to prepare, pointing to the lengthy opinion on the law in question that the AG's office published earlier this year. That opinion did express significant questions about the new abortion law and the legal ramifications it comes with. Planned Parenthood also pushed back, saying the expedited schedule is reasonable given the circumstances. The Supreme Court is the correct venue, they say, because of constitutional questions and that other reasons to delay given by the AG's office were irrelevant to the facts in their opinion. The filing does say, however, that Planned Parenthood is not opposed to extending the briefing schedule if the Supreme Court blocks the new law, pending a ruling on the new law, meaning Idaho abortion physicians could continue as is until the Supreme Court rules if the new law is acceptable or not. The most recent filing in the case is from the AG's office, again pushing back on arguments from Planned Parenthood, including the notion that they've had plenty of time to work on the case. The AG's office argues in part that preparing the AG opinion back in February is different work and is totally different circumstances now than it was back then. So it's wait and see on how the Idaho Supreme Court rules on the court schedule. A spokesperson for the AG's office tells KTVB, quote, As of now, the state would need to file its brief by the 14th, unless the court grants that motion to reconsider and sets a later date. The petitioners would then have to file their brief in response to the state's brief no later than seven days after the state's brief is filed, or arguments could then be set at the discretion of the court.
Uh, that's a lot of Joe right there. Uh, anyway, I was going to say, timing, or I should say, going to the Supreme Court is not an unheard of thing, straight to the Supreme Court. Right. The initiatives bill did that. But I'd have to believe, because of timing being an issue with this, that it goes into effect April 22nd, that going to a lower court first would only slow things down, because if they don't get what they want there, either party, then it would just kind of advance and appeal through that process. Right, and, and if you were Planned Parenthood's legal counsel, if you go to a lower court, it really gets the entire situation a lot more complex. Going through a district court is going to take a lot longer than it would be to get an expedited hearing at the Supreme Court. So if you're the AG's office arguing that this could be taken up at a lower court is both you know, an argument on its face, but also it could be an idea to buy time. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see though if the Idaho Supreme Court accepts this or not. They're still deciding on if exactly the expedited schedule will go the way that Planned Parenthood is proposing. Um, we are expecting to get a ruling and some more information from the Supreme Court really in the coming days and weeks. Again, the big day circled on the calendar for pro-choice advocates is April 22nd. That is when the law is supposed to officially go into effect. That's 30 days after Governor Little signed it. So April 22nd is coming up quickly here. Yes, it is. It's going to kind of be wait and watch, though, and we'll have to follow the court filings. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. All right, so we've talked a lot about all-day kindergarten here in recent weeks because the Idaho legislature made $46 million in early literacy funding available for school districts to offer it should they decide to. It's not the statewide all-day kindergarten bill many had hoped to pass, but more of a compromise. And it's kind of left a few parents in a compromising position who live in districts that opted to offer it this fall. That includes Boise, Twin Falls, and the state's largest school district, West Ada. West Ada recently removed, uh, I, myself, I should say, uh, have to, and many other parents are not at all happy with this option. Stay-at-home mom wrote us this question or this uh, text message, Carol, saying, I don't need the daycare option this full day kindergarten provided, nor do I agree my child who turns five at the end of July or did turn five at the end of July, will turn five, excuse me, should be made to attend all day school. It's a similar issue we've heard from other parents as well. Since all through the bill's progression through the legislative session, we were told all day kindergarten would be optional. So therein lies the confusion. Is it optional for the school districts or is it optional for families as well? So we reached out to West Data and they say full day tuition free kindergarten will be the standard starting in the fall. But quote, for families seeking a part time or early release option for kindergarten, we kindly request a meeting be held between the family and building administration to determine a kindergarten learning plan suitable for the individual child. In other words, West Ada says kindergarten will be full day for every student, but that can be changed with a meeting. Boise School District, basically the same as West Ada. Half day kindergarten can be an option, but only on a limited basis. Twin Falls School District, we reached out to them as well, and they say they're going to let parents decide whether they sign up for half day or full day, so half day is still an option. Point is, if you have a question or any questions about kindergarten in your school district coming up this fall, reach out to find out what your options might be this fall. Our country's first national park has a little bit of a toe in Idaho. Maybe more like a toenail. I know, either way, it has had a foothold in the gem state for 150 years. Well, there's a way to make sure it's still there for the next 150 with a once in a one, two, three, four, five lifetimes deal. Where are we taking you today? Well, this place has a flair for the classics. Classic architecture, classic education. I've said too much. If you have something to say, you can say it here. 208-321-5614. That's how you can be part of the 208 conversation. Send us your text messages. We like them clever, we like them concise, and we like them clean about anything we've talked about here on the 208. Or maybe something we should talk about. Send those two. And don't forget, include your name and the hashtag the 208.
It wasn't that long ago, just last month, March 1st to be exact, we told you about America's oldest national park turning 150 years old this year. And for their birthday, they're asking for $1,500 from everyone. Well, sort of. A group called Yellowstone Forever is now selling what they're calling inheritance passes. Maybe you've seen the headlines. You buy a $1,500 inheritance pass now with the money going to support park projects, and you'll get a pass that's good to use 150 years from now in the year 2172, which makes sense, right? Katya, you spoke to the CEO of this plan, and how exactly is this going to work five generations from now? Well, Brian, it's kind of a shocking price tag, as you just mentioned, to say the least. An annual pass to the park is usually around $70, but the idea with the inheritance pass is to make sure that generations to come have access to the park like it is now. So you buy this $1,500 pass now and gift it to family members 150 years from now, and when that time comes, your family will be able to visit the park in carloads rather than celebrating the anniversary and the 150th birthday of the park. Park, they decided to look ahead and focus their efforts on funding for the future of the park. Yellowstone is uh, the world's first national park. Visitation has increased, needs have increased, so we don't fund the infrastructure. Um, we don't pay for full-time salaries, but what we do do is help the park do their work better, whether it's wildlife research, or wildlife monitoring, cougars, native fish, bison. Uh, there'll be a tribal heritage center at Old Faithful, uh, whether it's water, snowpack, um, and uh, that affects the wildlife. Uh, it affects the uh, fauna uh, and the flora, the plants. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we are committing our funds to is sustainability in Yellowstone. The history, the cultural heritage of Yellowstone. When you look at the pictures of people who visited 100 years ago, 125 years ago, uh, it is really special. Uh, and I think that uh, the next generations will look back and uh, see uh, that, that uh, a lot has changed, but what, is, what hasn't changed uh, is Yellowstone. And the goal is to keep it that way. Of course, projects that the inheritance passes will fund range from energy saving methods like using efficient light bulbs, water conservation practices, and replacing windows with sustainable ones, and also adding electric car charging stations. Now that is all in addition to protecting wildlife, studying their behaviors, and preserving the park's beauty. And I know many people are wondering, yes, the buyers who purchase these passes will also get an annual pass themselves. Good for one year from when and they purchase it at only $1,500, Brian. So good for one year from when you purchase it. Say you buy it today. It's only good for the next year, $1,500, but not for the next years after that, the following years, because that's like five generations down the road that you're hoping to bequeath this past to somebody. <laughs> What if you don't have kids that go that far down the line? <laughs> and that is a great question. And we were all wondering, you know, what if, if someone who, like you said, gifts it now does not have any family members at that time? And I did ask the organization that question. Haven't heard back yet. So hopefully maybe just donations. It's a donation. You can write yeah. it off. So, and it's for a good cause. All right. Thank you very much, Katya. It's one of the last few left in the gem state. A must stop on any eastern Idaho road trip, but you might want to take a rain check thanks to last night's windstorm. It overlooks the Portneuf River Valley like, well, like the Parthenon. Well, part of the Parthenon anyway. Where it's at when we return. But before we tell you where that is, make sure you text in your questions and comments about the show. 208-321-5614. Keep your messages clean and concise and include your name and the hashtag the 208. We're going to share a few at the end of the show.
Okay, so we all felt and probably heard the wind yesterday, right? Made its way across the state, basically a straight line west to east kind of direction all the way across Idaho to where we were just talking about, Yellowstone. The winds were so strong, they knocked over what has to be considered one of the coolest attraction, attractions in eastern Idaho. The Spud Drive-In in Driggs. You ever been there? Built in 1953, it is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and it is still in operation today. Well, not today because of what happened yesterday. The 70 foot tall, nearly 70 year old original screen was completely destroyed after winds blowing as high as 55 miles an hour knocked it over last night. So it was just super windy and this, the screen blew over. It, initially it blew something off of our chimney on our fireplace. And, and so my husband peeked out the door to check the this, this screen and he saw that it was blown over. So awesome that it lasted so long. It's so awesome that they built it um, to last that long. And and um, I think it's just in the end, it's just old. We're really grateful for our community. We feel so supported and uh, we want them to know that. And the best way to put it into words for me is I, I see it out there laying on the ground and instead of necessarily feeling feeling heartbroken about it, I, I feel grateful. I feel really grateful for the the time that it served us and, and for the people who set it up and I'm grateful that we've had it and, and that it's built such a legend so that we can do our best to rebuild it. And they do plan to rebuild it. And those pictures showing snow on top of it after it felt just insult to injury. Katie says insurance will cover the damage. That's good, but they're looking for help getting it up in time to open for the summer season, which starts on June 1st. So it sounds like a good old fashioned drive in movie screen raisin. Is it coming to Driggs? Have seen that one coming, Brian. Now, we were uh, talking about the wind, and we can't see the wind, but we can certainly see the effects of wind, especially when it contributes to mud showers on all of our cars, and we saw that yesterday cleaning up the mess today. So what happened? This is actually a satellite loop uh, from yesterday afternoon and early evening, and you can see, as Brian was mentioning, the wind stream with the clouds here straight from west to east, blowing right into the Treasure Valley, and along those winds, carrying with it uh, the dust blowing in the wind coming from a dried up lake bed, Summer Lake in South Central Oregon. It's about halfway between Bend and Lakeview. So picking up that mineral dust, bringing it our, in our direction and then washing it out of our skies and making the mud showers that we saw on all of our cars and everything outside this morning. Still active wind, but it is calming as we head into the evening hours. Gusts only 25 to 30 miles per hour for the Treasure Valley. It's a wild ride in the seven day forecast and certainly a forecast to stay on top of. I do imagine Imagine as we continue to see drought conditions and dry conditions, we will also see more mud showers in our future as well. I think of all the places in Idaho that feature Greek architecture. There are a few out there. There's the columns at the Capitol building, a couple of buildings in downtown Boise have some of those ornaments, and there's an amphitheater at the College of Idaho. To just name a few, a couple of people send in some suggestions today naming the Capitol building of those teases that we showed you and even Boise High School. But today's where it's at takes us to eastern Idaho. Do you recognize those columns? If you've been to the campus of Idaho State University in Pocatello, you've likely seen them. But maybe you don't know why they're there, just sitting atop Red Hill, a big part of being a Bengal. It's not as classical of a story as you might expect. Towering over Idaho State University, just above the giant orange eye, are the literal pillars of the Pocatello campus. Four iconic, Ionic Greek columns that one could be convinced once stood for something sort of symbolic. I mean, one could imagine by reading the ISU New Student Orientation webpage, the three connected columns represented students while in college, supported by friends and classmates. The fourth standalone structure represented the student after graduation, ready to exert their ISU education on the real world. And yeah, not so much. The real story of the Red Hill Pillars is a little less embellished. They began fastened to the front of a funeral home. McCann's funeral home to be exact, the oldest in Pocatello, which started in 1916. Those pillars stood in place until 1966 when owner Jack Henderson wanted to relocate and he donated the pillars to the university. There, they sat in storage for five years until the Alumni Association decided to drag them up Red Hill. Hello everyone, my name is Ty Hobson. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Hello everyone, my name is Ty Hobson. This spring I'll be graduating cum laude with a bachelor's degree in both history and marketing. Ty's connection to the columns is stronger than school spirit. So I came up here to the top of Red Hill today to present in front of these pillars because my grandfather built them many years ago. And that story has always filled me with an immense sense of pride in this school. Ty said growing up, he'd always heard the story about his great grandfather. William Sheldon Lish. Who was kind of a handyman. He grew up during like the Great Depression, and so he was a carpenter, but had done so much in his life, building houses, uh, anything, you know, construction-wise. I think that just putting up the pillars was something that he fell into, like many of the things he did, just because he was handy. <laughs> a story he shared during his graduation speech. My grandfather passed the year I started at ISU, but his spirit has given me the encouragement I needed to make it here today. His work ethic inspired me to persevere. His story has shaped my own unique form of Bengal pride. It's gotta be pretty special for you though to hike up there and stand next to these pillars that your great grandfather helped build and you being the first to graduate. Yeah, it was cool. It's like the the most uh, poignant thing when you're there. And uh, I think it's a cool symbol to help everybody feel good about what they're doing there. My grandfather, he had very important words to him were scatter sunshine. And when you look up at the pillow, there's, there's always some beautiful sun <clears throat> beams coming through them. I think that is kind of his lasting legacy, scattering positivity all over the world. Ty's grandfather passed away in 2015. The pillars are kind of a rite of passage for students at ISU. It's tradition for new students to make their hike up Red Hill, the trail, for their first year picture. Then there's the homecoming tradition of hiking to the pillars just before midnight to become a true bangle. Then at midnight, maybe you share a kiss with a significant other, becoming each other's True bangle, if you get my drift. Or maybe just because sunsets are pretty cool from the columns. It's a good reason to go up there. Either way, the pillars are where it's at at Idaho State University.
Our final moments of the show. Let's get right to your comments here on the 208. It seems the Idaho Supreme Court could easily stay the new abortion law since Roe v. Wade is still constitutional law in the United States, unless Idaho is no longer part of the U.S., as Steve. Well, that's the thing. With this law, they kind of skirted away from it. They didn't make it illegal uh, before six weeks, but it also put the citizen as executive branch in there by allowing people to sue the doctor for performing the abortion. So they kind of got around it a little bit. Not quite completely illegal, not quite a violation yet, but that will be decided. Giving a shout out to all amazing librarians out there for National Librarians Week. They've had a rough couple of months defending the freedom to read and fighting absurd bills. Agree, and this one from Deb and Steve. Red Hill at Idaho State University. My wife and I know it well. Have anything to do with a kiss at midnight? 